Um, and I, I, I think that, I think that here I'm curious about, um, how you accord agency within these processes within this. Um, I think you said something to the effect of this relational ontology that's relational all the way down. And there are moments in your book where you speak in those terms and, and sort of mutual implication, co-evolution. Um, and obviously I also really appreciate how the past is always present in the present. And that's something that's, that's, something that's in, embedded within um, uh, the Buddhist philosophy as you uh, articulate it. Um, and that, that works to define who and what we are, limits and possibilities for what we might be, et cetera, et cetera. But in when it comes to agency, you talk about how human values are directly embedded in the development of AI and technological systems and that um, this development as it's ongoing um, produces societal impacts through sort of net network effects and feedback loops. You also speak of AI as a kind of mirror of humanity embodying human conflicts um, and values. Um, you, you just spoke a few moments ago about AI as also having adaptive creativity, which, which seems to indicate it has some agency. But, but throughout the book, the book, you largely accord agency to human beings and largely at the individual level too. Um, and you write about this in, in terms of and in relation to avoiding undesirable futures um, and predic predicament resolution. Um, and you offer, you offer a kind of diagnosis of some of the perils or dangerous futures that AI um, might um, produce across a number of domains. Um, and so I guess my, to, to sort of arrive at the question, which is, which is multiple, um, where it, 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 how, okay. Could you discuss how these undesirable futures for AI, um, embody these relational aspects of AI and humanity and how you understand agency in this process, um, is, both human agency and machine agency, but also personal and collective. Is, is there a collective agency that's possible or is that only an effect of individual preference choices and modes of attention and presence? Yeah, I mean, this ultimately is gonna get into the, the super deep dive into the metaphysics. Uh, and I'm concerned that you know a lot of people might not be particularly interested in that. So let me try to oh, keep we're it. Nerds. We, we like that stuff. <laughs> But let, let me try to keep it a way that's not maybe as specifically about Buddhist metaphysics and try to translate it into terms that I think more generally uh, useful. Um, if you take relationality seriously as what's ontologically basic, then agents and things acted upon are the results of abstracting from agentive relations and identifying within those relations a pole that you can refer to as the agent and the other pole, the acted upon. So from a Buddhist perspective, subjects and objects, self and other, all of these need to be ultimately understood in terms of non-duality. But at the level that we're engaging the world, we're engaging the world as subjects with the world that's objectively out there that resists some of my intentions and goes along with other of my intentions. So that's clearly our experience. And when Buddhists are sort of historically were thrown back on that, the question of well, how do you make this jive? You're saying that there's no agents, but I'm experiencing myself as an agent. You say there's no ultimate subject object distinction that the world is karmically configured and therefore always ultimately responsive to shifts and values and intentions and actions like the ones I'm engaged in, but I'm seeing the world resisting. How does all this play out exactly? Give me a little bit more insight. And so what, what the response was is, well, yes, at a certain level, consciousness is relational all the way down. Conscious simply is the differentiation of matter and what matters, of sensed and sensing presences. That's what consciousness is. Everything that has been happening in the cosmos is transformations of consciousness. 
in terms of qualities of consciousness, extensive consciousness, the horizons, etc. So different patterns of differentiation playing out, giving us different forms of consciousness. At some point in that evolutionary dynamics, self-consciousness came about. And Buddhists are really precise about what they mean by self-consciousness, and that is consciousness as being the recipient of experiences. And if you do meditative discipline long enough, you start to realize that what they're talking about is the fact that, you know, we normally think of ourselves as the thinker of our thoughts and the haver of our emotions. But when you start to observe meditatively what's going on, the thoughts appear. You don't make them happen. You're the one sitting there quietly meditating and a thought pops up. And if you get really good at meditating, you can see what the conditions that led to that were. A certain thing happened during the day, the resonances between the thing that happened during the day and memories of past events from long ago work together to create the conditions of this interference pattern, like a diffraction pattern. And your thought was like this diffraction pattern that came up because these relational dynamics were playing out presently and other relational dynamics were playing out long ago and a thought pops up. Now what the self does is it gets attached to that thought and it starts to amplify. It says, oh, that, that's a really interesting diffraction pattern. You know, like when waves intersect in a pool or in the ocean. And they start to say, yeah, that's a really interesting pattern. Maybe I can amplify that. Maybe let me dig into that a little bit more, put some energy into it. And then starting to have the experience of this diffraction pattern as something different for me, the agent. And so is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? Well, it's a good thing in the sense that it allows us to projectively think forward to a future and what we might want as a future. The bad thing is it's all imaginary. It disengages us from the actual events taking place around us. And there's always a danger in that. So that kind of thinking leaves us open to really significant vulnerabilities. So the basic Buddhist teaching is, look, that kind of thinking is part of what we do as humans. There's nothing really wrong with it, but it's not superlative. If you really want to engage in your situation in a way that allows you to relate virtuosically with the changing dynamics that you're a part of, you better be wholly present, not wrapped up in following out these diffraction patterns from all the stuff that happened in the past. So ultimately, Buddhism would say, what we're trying to do is to develop with intelligent technology new qualities of agency in which we as human agents and algorithmic systems as machine agents are in interdependent collaborative relationship with the purpose, the intent of realizing more superlative economic relations, political relations, social relations, environmental relations, relations of artistic, aesthetic relations, etc. Multiply the, the kinds of relations to, to add an infinity. What we're trying to do is to figure out ways that we can collaborate, synthesize what carbon-based intelligences are good at and what presently uh, silicon-based intelligences are good at and to see how the merger of those could be really humane. And so the question of the book is, what do we mean by humane? What does it mean to be humane? It's not just being human. So these ethical systems, the ethical standards and guidelines that are being developed in AI circles at the corporate level, state level, they all talk about AI aligned with human values. And I'm like, sorry, human values give us domestic violence today. They give us international warfare. They give us economic inequality so bad that in 2019, the eight richest people, eight richest people in the world had more wealth than the three and a half poorest billion people. That's our human values now. And intelligent technology is holding up a mirror to us of precisely those values and will exacerbate, accentuate, deepen those inequalities and conflicts. It doesn't have any willpower to do anything differently. So the point of who do we need to be present to ask is a question of if these technologies, as we become more synthetically involved with them and interdependent with them, and as their capacities change, as they develop and evolve, where do we really want things to be going? And if we really want things to be better, we need to figure out what it means to be superlative human beings and to start acting in a manner that's consistent with that. Rather than saying, I've got these values and that's all that matters to me is upholding those values because we've got these conflicts and that's leading to the world that we've got. And so where does virtuosity, improvisation and creativity fit within um, uh, 
a response to who do we need to be present as in order to respond to the predicament of our yeah you know i i tend to think a lot in terms of i, I guess it's because of this buddhist way of thinking about the world in terms of relations and relational dynamics and patterns in relational dynamics i i tend to think about that musically and i play guitar with a buddy we get together every sunday and on a really good night he walks in and he sets up his acoustic electric guitar and gets it plugged in and I sit there and I'm just kind of noodling around and we go from me noodling into playing something together. There's no plan. There's no announcement of what the chord structure is going to be. There's no harmonic layout. It's just sounds that resonate in a certain way, a certain rhythm to them. And maybe 30 minutes later, we go, wow, that was wild, you know, because we'll have explored a musical terrain invented out of nothing, out of silence, and end up with this world that we both experience, the basis of which is improvising with an ear toward what's going to carry us forward into playing something we've never played before. It's not about playing what we know how to play. It's about playing something we never played before, or playing something that we played, but in a way that we've never played before. So it's this looking at what that cutting edge of that is. And if I'm playing and I want my music partner, Russell, to change what he's doing and to modulate from a major key to a minor key, one option is I reach over and I put my finger on his guitar and, and finger the note on the, on the fingerboard that I want him to be playing. Pretty bad idea. He's going to get upset. The music is going to crumble to an end. You know, bad way of doing things. But that's generally speaking what we're doing in the world when we want to try to get other people to change their conduct. You know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to do things differently. Here's the right way to do things. This is the way we ought to be doing it. And then we tell them and expect them to live up to that. It's not going to happen. It's more like musical improvisation. What can I offer to my listening partner, my guitar improvising partner, as a hook, a line, a something, a note? that's different enough that gets him to rethink what he's doing to respond in a new way, other than the way that he would other by be inclined, not because I told him what to do, but because he saw an opportunity to do something new. So what I think what we're trying to do is to figure out, can these technologies be used in such a way that they can trigger off in us humans new ways of responding to the challenges that we face so that we can actually improvise some resolutions to the predicaments that we're confronting. And we can't do that if we know already where we're gonna end up. It's like playing music improvisation. You don't play to get done. You don't have an idea what you're gonna end up with. It's open-ended creative exploration. But once you've done something that's really like magical, if it's a good night, you remember enough of it to be able to play the thing again, to be able to try to, in a sense, institutionalize it. So we can take these enlightening encounters that we have with one another when we're grappling with what's the ethical thing to do here? What's the virtuosic thing to do here? And to remember enough of that when we go back into our normal settings to take that and to incorporate elements of that in making changes to the institutions, to the relational dynamics that we're part of. And that's the way in which this change is going to take place. It's not going to happen by getting a blueprint and designing it all out in advance and saying, this is the world we want to realize and let's get there. So David Harvey, I think, was entirely correct when he said, we absolutely need utopian thinking. The most disastrous thing humanity has ever done is to try to take utopian thinking and put it into actual practice. It operates at a different register. The thinking's good. Putting it into practice has always proved disastrous because it's a blueprint. And I really like how you develop this idea of um, ethical virtuosity and how you situate in the book um, virtuosity, especially with your the guitar, the music um, example, it's relational um, and it's like continual striving for excellence as like as an exceeding horizon. So specifically for ethical virtuosity, um, the virtuosity is not the practice of the striving, but rather the event of its achievement. Um, and you comment in the book, if intelligence is adaptive conduct, realizing ethical virtuosity as an achievement of the practice of ethical intelligence means engaging in conduct that exemplifies superlative capacities for and commitments to differing responsibly and responsibly, both from and for others, where it really puts you within the world and within others. 
And so we're actually really curious, and Alex and I have been talking about this before, about to hear more about how this can speak to the challenges of intelligent technologies, particularly in terms of ethical virtuosity. And one of the questions that kind of came up is who or what determines virtuosity? Um, and we think this is an especially an important question, particularly, you know, given the rise of authoritarianism identifications and say even like the persistence of racism and xenophobia and so on. Um, so, and then essentially to this, right, it's how do you get people to change? How do you establish the stakes for people to desire and approach ethics in a relational karmic way to contend with the evolution of you know, synthetic intelligences as it being a mirror of humanity and human values and the predicaments of our present, present in order to proliferate the modes of virtuosity that you describe? Well, obviously a huge question. Um, and I think I would go back to one of the things that in that passage that you read didn't get mentioned in there, but it's mentioned just shortly thereafter, and that's this idea about ethical diversity. And the idea that what I'm suggesting we're in need of is not a new ethics of artificial intelligence or a new ethics of information or any of the other opportunities to have a new species of ethics. What we need is an ethical ecosystem that is a way of understanding ethics as very basically defined, the art of human course correction, of actively using our collective intelligence to evaluate our value systems and to take from different value systems, given the kinds of ethical inclinations that are embedded in those value systems, to find appropriate resonances among those in relation to resolving the particular predicaments that we're facing. So I'm really um, convinced that no one ethical system is going to suffice to do the work we need. And so I think that the ethics that we're talking about and the kinds of engagement that we're talking about, critical engagement with intelligent technology, have to be at the very minimum intercultural, international, interdisciplinary to be sure, but I think also intergenerational because for someone like myself, mid 60s, and someone like my youngest son, uh, 19 years old, he's grown up in a very different environment than I did. I mean, his basic understanding of how social dynamics work is entirely different, having been informed by social media, digital social media platforms than mine are. And so we need to take that into account because what I consider to be a virtuosic move might not strike him as virtuosic at all. And that needs to get sort of negotiated and so what my perspective would be is that, number one, I cannot provide a blueprint and nobody else can either. And that what we want to do is to get together to improvise ethically. That is not to do um, what accountants do when they're fudging the numbers in the books. You know, that's a different kind of improvisation and very non-ethical. What we want to do is to take the different contributions from different traditions, uh, from different ethnic groups, from different class groups. You know, it's not just generational, it's not just cultural, it's taking all these differences that are constitutive of the world that we're in and allowing people from all these different perspectives to actually work through the difficulty of achieving the kinds of relational dynamics that all of them would agree are more superlative than the ones that they've been in. What does that entail? It entails a lot of work. So any of you who are family members and have children know how hard it can be, even in a family where everybody loves everybody and where some of them came out of your body, you know, you would think that this leads to just ultimate allegiance and togetherness, and it doesn't. There's conflicts in families. There's predicaments in families. And we find it difficult to resolve those predicaments. Some families end up riven and, and, and cut in two for generations because of disagreements. So it's not easy, but I think that it could create enough forums where people across national, cultural, ethnic, religious, disciplinary, generational boundaries can come together with their differences on full display, where their differences are not ignored or celebrated and then left to the side, 
but where differences are engaged as the basis of mutual contribution to some form of yet to be identified shared flourishing. That's diversity in the sense that I'm defining it. Diversity is not about numbers. It's a relational quality that emerges when the differences among all the, the various participants serve as the basis of mutual contribution to sustainably shared flourishing. And we're shared here is not like the common flourishing. It's like the common good. I, I really don't like the invocations of common good because as Jean-Luc Nancy, the French philosopher says, the common always has a disciplinary edge to it. Whereas the shared is like what we do in Hawaii. We pop luck, you know, we want everybody to bring a different dish to the dinner, to the table. You know, if you bring rice and you bring rice and I bring rice, terrible pot luck, right? You got to have some fish, you got to have some pork, you got to have some, you know, la la, you got to have some noodles, you got to have salad, you need dessert. You need all these different things to come together, not to create this salad, not to create a potpourri, but to create the feeling, the feeling of sharing food together. It's not the smorgasbord. The point is not the different kinds of food being present. It's the, the kinds of appreciation for what others have brought to the table. It's that appreciation that diversity relies on, not the mere presence of difference. And so that's the struggle. Who do we need to be present as to do that? And I think this requires training. It's a practice. To be a good parent is a practice. To be a good son or daughter is a practice. And we need to start those practices very early by enabling everybody who grows up and comes through our education systems to have freedom of attention and freedom of intention. Those need to be assured as the basis of any realistically helpful education system, whether it's taking place in the, ha in the family, in a charter school, in a public school, this should be the, the universal global commitment is to realizing that.